Yeah, happy mo happy Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're talking about community matters this morning with Rick Langiardi. He's running for mayor, uh, and uh, he's here with us. Thank you for joining us, Rick. Jay, always good to be with you. Always a challenge to be with you. Well, you're a business candidate. That makes you very interesting, certainly in the business community or anybody who cares about business. And I, I want to ask you, why in the world are you running? I mean, you, you're not happy with your life. Uh, will this make you happier? Uh, or will this make you sad? I mean, a lot of people think you're crazy to run for office, Rick. Why? Well, it really wasn't the pursuit of happiness. It was really more the pursuit of, of, of love for this place that I've lived here since 1965. And candidly speaking, you know, through the lens I had as a general manager of Hawaii News Now, but really even my other work that I've done in the community, I looked at the issues. And again, I made my decision right before Christmas, obviously pre-COVID. Um, but I was looking at the issues that were facing us as a community uh, with respect to homelessness, rail, neighborhood crime, infrastructure, elder care, all those classic talking points, you know, of, of what a mayor and really being the CEO of the city would be about and really felt that we had a, you know, we, we had those crises, but we also had a leadership crisis. Yeah, you're, really, you've, been, you've been running news for a long time with Hawaii News Now. Well, I, was there, I, was the the first, I was there from the first hour. They came to me on December 18th, 2008, after a broken economy. And, I remember. Um, and said, you know, the ownerships were brought to their knees and wanted to know if I would agree to be the guy to lead that and build it. And I did, because it wasn't out of economic greed, it was out of survival, and survival for our community and what we could create. So we took the notion that we would build a 21st century multimedia company for Hawaii. That was the week before Christmas. By April, we were pretty much all clear with the FCC and DOJ. And then we had to go through some other uh, things because of more notices and a few other things. August, we announced officially, and then October, we moved in. So October 26, 2009. Community service. And so your local connections thing, where you get up there and uh, tell them your views about this and that and various issues, and those are personal views, and you're always passionate. I must say, I told you this before, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, you know, it wasn't totally me as an individual per se. We work, I work with my editorial team in the newsroom as well because there are so many things that go on in Honolulu and we only did two different topics a week. And so we would discuss what would be the most relevant, what we felt we needed to say. I used to love the parts where I would give shout outs, but most of the time we were trying to talk about something that we really didn't want our anchors to be doing from the anchor desk. But as a news organization, knowing what we knew, we really felt we needed to put that spotlight well, on. It was special to see the, you know, the manager yourself come around with opinions it fomented people thinking you know that's the idea to get them to think and i think you've done that but Thank let you. me ask you this you know your qualifications do not include politics you've been no. a business guy you've been a sports guy you've been a manager par excellence and all that for decades and decades and generations but not politics now we have a president in office who ran on the platform that he had no experience in politics and i don't know if you agree with me but that i don't think that worked out so, you know, I mean, maybe he should have had some experience in politics. How yeah. Do you, how do you answer that concern? Well, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to talk about the president of the United States and certainly don't want to draw any comparisons to me and Donald Trump in that regard. Um, but I, I look, I, I'm not new to politics in a sense of somebody who's been running the broadcast operations. You know, every cycle we would get involved with politicians, hosting debates, certainly throughout the course of the year, invariably dealing with them on issues and other related matters. So it's not like I was oblivious to that whole realm, but I looked at the mayor's job as I think most people should look at the mayor's job, nonpartisan and the fact that the incumbent was terming out. And so I wouldn't have to sit there and try to run against somebody and spend my time bashing them as we've all seen far too many times. I mean, the whole rhetoric out of Washington is, for me is very distasteful. So the job was gonna be open and really uh, and everybody, and I talked to a, a number of mayors, this is running a city. This is, this is a day-to-day -day operational thing. The phone rings on everything. You know, I, I know that there's a legislature to deal with. There's certainly going to be a really kind of a remake of a city council with five new people. I didn't look at this as a political job. I looked at this as a leadership job, and that I have been my whole career. Well, you know, the thing about cities, and I think people sometimes forget, is that the city constitutionally, you know, it's fire, um, police, infrastructure, water, that kind of thing. That's what it's about. It's not necessarily, for example, about economy, although the city of Honolulu has had economic consultants and advisors and offices from time to time. I'm not sure that they, they ever really did all that much. And, and, and now it becomes an issue. I wanna discuss some of those 
basic functions. One of the basic functions is, of course, the uh, you know prosecution of crimes, because the prosecutor is under the city. I don't know if people fully understand it's under the city. And I'm thinking of uh, you know things that you may have seen or been involved in um, that have helped you understand you know what it is um, and how the prosecutor's office works and how public safety works. So um, you know, for example, um, you had a, you had a, an experience, and you can comment on it. This is some 35 years ago. It was the subject of an article in the Civil Beat. Uh, July 2nd, and it was about this straw straw buyer kind of thing that was going on in Honolulu at the time. Um, you want to comment at all on that? Because it, you know, it was uh, it was a piece that was not particularly complimentary. On the other hand, uh, you know, I was practicing law at the time, and I understand it. But why don't you tell me your view of it? Well, it was 37 years ago. It was in 1983. I was in my mid 30s now. You know, Jay, I've kept pretty tight on this because I was so surprised by it. So before I say anything else, let me just say, throughout my entire career. I've been vetted deeply in the roles and jobs that I've had, not the least of which was two bank boards, and one of them was Central Pacific Bank, you know, locally. And actually, both banks, both institutions were locally. But even in the work that I've done, um, when you hold a, the responsibility for a broadcast license, and I've been done that at the general manager level in Hawaii, but also in San Francisco, Seattle, I've been president of national companies in all the te ten major markets with major major owners. You're vetted very deeply. This has never ever come up in my uh, in my in my background checks. It was put out of the way. So very simply put, uh, at the time, it was a guy named Sam Daly. He was a very prominent real estate developer. He was a retired Air Force Colonel, very very credible, paternalistic, if you will. He brought a bank president to town from Kansas City named Bill LeMaster. Um, and this could be chronicled, but you can't even Google it. But it was part of the the uh, the Oppo research that they did. Uh, and the long and the short of it is these guys convinced me and a couple of my other colleagues to sign some promissory notes for development on the windward side. And we naively did that. As it turned out, this thing was a scam. Um, I ended up being a plaintiff against this bank, which was then closed by the FDIC. I had a financial liability with the FDIC because we signed a promissory note for which they were unforgiving, which is what forced me at that time into a very painful Chapter 7 bad part of my life, my wife and young kids at the time. But then I also became the key witness in a trial in Kansas City, put those guys in jail. So I was not even, I was more than exonerated. I was never even involved. It's just that article came out and made it look like my lack of integrity, or for that matter, that I was trying to defraud somebody when in fact, we were the ones defrauded. And I just shared more with you on this program than I have to anybody else. I've been very private about it because clearly this was designed to try to hurt me and embarrass me and my being new to politics, not relevant in my life. My body of work here in this town in Hawaii speaks to that. Okay, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, 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 I was naive at the time, 37 years ago, uh, and I went on to rebuild my life. All those guys went to jail. Appreciate that. Thank you for, thank you for sharing on that point, Rick. Um, it's important. Um, so the, taking that, taking that together with the, the whole affair in uh, Kealoha uh, yep. and uh, Keith Kaneshiro, you know, the trouble in HPD, the trouble in the prosecutor's office, and taking that um, together with the, uh, the Miski affair that came out about uh, murder for hire and the mob here in Honolulu doing murder for hire, very scary business. All of a sudden, you know, the, the whole prosecutor race takes on a new, a new element, um, and you do have... You know, the, at least the observation of what's going on, you do have some contact with the way the courts work. Um, and I'd like to know your thoughts about those things in the new administration with a new prosecutor, whoever that may be, um, you know, which is part of the city. Uh, I, I think you, you do bring a certain amount of experience on those things. And I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Well, you know, there's a lot that's been said of late about safety. The word safety has come up so much in our day-to-day -day vernacular as it relates to the impact of COVID-19. But you know, don't forget that our police department has a lot to do with our individual safety and who we are as a community they sworn to protect and serve. So you know, historically, if you want to do the quick look back, um, the Kealoa scandal was incredible. And you know, Hawaii News now led the charge on that. I'm not here to, you know, but we were on that story months before anybody else would touch that. So I had a chance to obviously think about that a lot because we had conversations in that process about we had better be correct, if you will. And it turned out that we were, and so on. And, and I actually, since you alluded to my doing editorials, had asked Keith Kaneshiro on more than one occasion 
as a matter of integrity and as a matter of what was good for our community to step down. Obviously, that fell on deaf ears. Not that anything I had to say, but I took that position. I think community safety, especially in tumultuous times like we're going through right now, or even a murder for hire scandal, like you just said, that happens. That is very unsettling. I think we're really at a crossroads we've never been. And I've lived here since 1965, where fear and uncertainty, and, and honestly, maybe in some cases where trust needs to be restored, are at a place we've never seen it before. Now, that said, I'm very proud to have gotten the Shopo endorsement. I am also very confident in Susan Ballard. I mean, I've spent time with her and other top ranking officials, as well as with the with the guys in the field, the lieutenants and sergeants and whatever, went along a couple of police ride-alongs. I was very grateful to get the Shopo uh, you know, endorsement. Um, I look forward to a new prosecutor. I think we've been compromised uh, to take nothing away from anybody else right now, but having that combined on the heels of uh, the investigation of our police chief, we need to restore that kind of confidence and trust. It's an important part of the psyche of people who live in a community. I can tell you, Jay, year after year, doing market research on why people looked at news or what they were interested in, whatever, first and foremost, family safe, am I safe, was a real big driver for why people read news, watch news, try yeah. to learn about it. And yeah, we, and especially now, you know, because um, there is a relationship, a correlation between COVID and being locked up and having to spend all your time at home with an increase in domestic violence and violence on the street. Um, and, and we're going to see that. We're going to see that more and more the longer the COVID goes on. Um, there's a lot, so there's been a lot lately that's been written about. In fact, I just read an article last week about people locally filing for bankruptcies and the state of mind that brings people to in the frustration. It was already pre this, you know, we already had a lot of stressors. I mean, when you stop and think about 50% of our people work paycheck to paycheck that number on, on, on is going to even go up um, more so. But, you know, people having to work multiple jobs and the fact that life is no fun. You asked me, you opened up about the pursuit of happiness. I used to sit there and wonder about people working 16 hour days, trying to sleep and keep a family in between the remaining hours. And that was not just a few people. That's 50 percent of our people. So, you know, a lot of stress there. Now, those very same people are going to be brought to stresses that you've never imagined before. It's only human nature that the tensions will build and how that manifests itself, we don't know, um, but it's gonna be really tough. Let me give you one quick example. One of the highlight, one of the statistics and all the statistics that are coming out that has really gotten my attention. I spent the last 18 years as a proud member of the Hawaii Food Bank Board. In the month of May, the food bank, well, let me put it this way. Every year, historically, pretty much because of our capacity, we gave out between 800,000 and 1 million pounds of food a month, a month. That's a lot of food tied to capacity, and it fed 285,000 people a year. That's 12 million pounds of food, very needed for people that were working to keep a roof over their head, couldn't quite make ends meet. And that's not Jay counted 50 times, that's non-redundant, okay? So that doesn't even show up in our homeless counts. That's just how fragile, this isn't just the Hawaii Food Bank. There's a lot of other services as well, but just that. So they gave out that, and that was pretty, pretty all out, uh, all out effort, if you will. Um, in the month of May, they gave out 4 million pounds of food. In the month of July, they gave out 2 million pounds of food because they didn't have any more to give out. Right. Well, that's, that's, a, that's really an important point that, you know, this may not be sustainable. We may not have the food. We may not have the supply lines. You know, even our inter-island transportation is jeopardized lately. Uh, Honolulu may find itself hungry right across the board. We may. The, mayor, the mayor is going to be right in the middle of that. Um, right. You know, maybe not not necessarily agreeing with the state or the governor, not necessarily agreeing with the president on reopening and pausing, reopening and pausing, or what to do about the number of cases or deaths. And I mean, you know, I, I I would say you'll have to agree with me that COVID is the most important news story of our lives right now. Absolutely. And the question is, how do you see going into that? What is the special sauce you're going to bring to the mayor, the the, the, the mayor's office to deal with it? All of the re various ramifications. You know, this is unprecedented. And so I don't want to, um, I don't have a crystal ball. Let me, let me give this perspective right now, because right now, if you break it down, yes, I'm a candidate for mayor, but I'm really a retired business guy trying to be a, become mayor and don't even have any more the intel I used to have when I was on the inside running Hawaii News Now, you know? Um, and so, you know, the other part of that, J, 
Jay, is I've never been in front of a job five and a half months before. And that's where we are right now, approximately get to January. But, I, but just by coincidence, if you will, we announced five months ago in February at the old stadium park. And I stop and think about what's happened in that last five months. I mean, a month later, we're shut down with, you know, in watching this unfold in painstaking way and almost in disbelief. Uh, but knowing at least for the interim, we've had some subsidies through the CARES Act and, and our local banks did a great job of getting PPP money. They, over, they overreached and got to their credit, got two and a half billion dollars. Um, but a lot of those monies and resources are going to be coming to a, a, an end. And so it is hard to predict what five and a half months from now is going to look like. That said, I have been on some interesting calls, even with the military, we've gone through a lot of pandemic training and different things. We're gonna to have to enlist, incorporate and do things we've never done before. We are vulnerable. We are all vulnerable. In the beginning, when I was talking about elder care before COVID and talking about societies, you know, a judge by the way they treat their most vulnerable and talking about our Kapuna and wanting to expand some of the programs, it's all shifted now. It's all shifted to us being a vulnerable people. So I'm gonna watch closely what gets done Clearly, uh, we're going to need more federal money. Clearly, I don't want to be presumptuous about I'm in a, a field of some tough competitors here, but we get elected, um, you know, irrespective of how difficult Washington may or may not be, but working with our people in Washington and anybody else, we're going to have to go and get it. I think we have a special case, given our isolation, our vulnerability out here uh, and all the other things. I candidly, I was encouraged yesterday to hear Josh Green uh, on the news, and Dr. Moscovich talk about the fact that it looks like getting our testing numbers up some, um, that we, you know, we've got to get to a certain threshold of being able to do that. We're still away from that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things here that we've never been before that have really dire consequences. We will be in a fight to survive. There's no question. And I am concerned about basic needs of food. I am concerned about whether or not we can get federal monies in the short term to provide subsidies to keep people from being evicted. Because if you really understand that cycle of the people who they pay rent to and they've got to pay to somebody else, there's only so far that goes, right? So, you know, the subsidies, I, I would tell you, we'll probably have to get into some housing. You know, I said this the other day, Jay, at a time like this and what I'm learning about politics, there's a tendency for politicians to want to talk about long-term plans. You know, I think all of that goes out the window right now on what's going to happen three or four years from now. I mean, I'm really practical, common sense grounded in, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about crises management. I've always been a turnaround guy and what you need to do. But at the same time, I'm a bystander watching what's going to happen. And I certainly we'll get some indications as we get past the primary, hopefully, and whatever, and we'll have ample time. But it, this is... We've, we've not been here before. It's Look, they announced the September closing. I can tell you, I was talking to hoteliers the week before in Waikiki, and they were praying to God that wasn't going to happen. And no sooner did they announce it, and they actually were going to say indefinitely, but they chose to say September. Um, the Holly Kalani said, we're closed for a year. And I think what you're going to hear from what I learned, and I don't, I, I'm not going to name properties, I, you're going to hear a number of properties come out right now and say they're not going to open up till January. And so what is gonna transpire is people who were on furloughs or temporary layoffs who still had benefits and cash subsidies are now gonna be permanently laid off. And that's gonna impact their healthcare and the ramifications of that because if they go to Medicaid, how that you know, plays out uh, or for some that they, look, the University of Hawaii, before we had this last 60 day extension was predicting a couple of months ago, Kyle Bonham, that Hawaii would lose 25 to 35,000 people in 21 because of no work. I remember that. You know, we've never seen an excess like that. We've never even talked that way. Admittedly, we've not been growing either. We're the only city in the top 100 that's had a negative population growth over the last four years, and we've been losing really good people. Well, you know, the big, the big problem right now, and I really like your view on this, is this whole balancing act between public health and stopping those cases. I don't remember the exact number, but even in the morning paper, I think it was somewhere close to 25 or 28 cases, uh, and it's creeping up on us. Um, so the question is, what, what, public health versus reopening. And, yeah. and when we, and we speak of reopening, we're really speaking a large part of the hotels. And, and you talk about five, local five and all that. And, well, and how do you balance that as the mayor? Well, I think fundamental from a balancing standpoint, good public health and a stable economy need to go hand in hand. They're not mutually exclusive concepts, right? 
But what's happened here is we are out of balance for good public health. And I understand, look, I've spoken before, I've spoken before Local 5, I've met with Eric Gill, uh, we had a, went down to the state capitol when they were uh, protesting, had a private conversation with them afterwards for quite some time. I understand the concern of the hotel workers who want to feel safe because we're talking about right now, our cases are going up. I think we need to better discipline ourselves with masks and social distancing and washing our hands. If I've watched one expert after another, and I've watched all kinds of things and read everything, that seems to be what everybody is urging people to do. At the very least, we can, we can have better control. We don't have any tourists right now and our cases are going up. We're pretty lax. I don't know how to estimate the population, but I bet it's probably close to the national number, which is about 30% of the people are refusing to do that. I mean, it's always seeing cases go up, which is gonna spook everybody, but make no mistake about it. We can't keep our borders closed forever. That's not sustainable. We can't. And, and even then, when they do start to come back, they're not gonna come back in big numbers, okay? And let me give you a perspective on that. For what well, it's there was worth. a report of a couple of hundred people being arrested over the weekend. And I'm saying to myself, that's got to hit the national news. So you come as a tourist, you get arrested, you think you're going to come again? Uh, that's got to be, a, you know, a discouragement of potential tourists, no? Well, I think Hawaii still enjoys global cachet, unlike any other place on the earth that I can think of. I mean, from the standpoint of, you say Hawaii and it's it's magical, and I, you know, I've, I've always felt that way. I mean, look at me and you. Look at look at look, look at who we are. Look at the shirts we're wearing, and look at where we live. You know, I mean, this is a special place, right? Um, so I don't think that necessarily goes away. And, and in the short term, you know, it might make some people feel like, well, it's even safer because they're paying attention to people who violate. Because look, in the world, in the global theater right now, our incidence of cases and deaths is considered minuscule. You know, so I think anybody hearing about that, look, it's not attractive to come here and get arrested. Don't get me wrong. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be that big a deterrent. It could actually be a turn on for some people that, you know, please come here and do what you're asked to do. And that's the point I wanted to make about Local 5 and the hotel workers is because they saw the same thing happen in Las Vegas once they opened up, tourists show up and all of a sudden they get in the casinos and they're taking their mask off and whatever, you know, they're not, and that's a big concern. Can we get the tourists to at least on the properties and a few other places that they were in restaurants at least at the time that they sit down and get their food? Can, will they adhere to that? Mm -hmm. You know, because we don't want to expose our local workers to anything that's dangerous. And that's what we're trying to balance out right now. Now, what about what about uh, industries other than tourism? You know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people saying this is a time to reimagine our economy. We've been talking about diversification since John Burns. I'm not kidding. Yep. And, right. and uh, you know, now maybe is the is, it's, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. We really haven't done anything about diversifying, really nothing. Um, so is that something that is on your list of priorities? Well, look, that's a great political buzzword, okay? You know, I mean, everybody wants to talk about it. You're absolutely right. I went back and researched. I read actually the, uh, going back to Governor Burns over the last 50 years, I mean, that's always been, we're going to diversify our economy. I read a whole thing in 2000, what they projected. Here we are 20 years later, and very little of that has happened. Um, so, you know, the reality is we took the drug, you know, we took the money from tourism. 2019 was really the manifestation of that at $17.8 billion, two billions in tax revenue, and not really a whole lot of investment, uh, other things, if you will. Doesn't seem feasible, Jay, right now to talk about diversifying our economy in the midst of what you and I just got done within five minutes ago of talking about survival and being real. One of the things I do like about Hawaii is it's, very, been, it's a very entrepreneurial place. And I think we do have to stay open to entrepreneurial ideas. I definitely think that there are things that we can do to help with construction and create jobs in construction and certainly the energy sector and the ag sector, but I don't want to kid anybody about it. I've moved my thinking since the September pushback to much more of a short-term crisis kind of a thing and to see what we can do versus something that would be three or four years from now. Three or four years from now may not exist in the life of many, many people. So I want to be real about that. that I think it's going to be a, a crunch for the city though. Um, you know, the, the TAT is still being blocked by the state. You're not getting it. Yep. Um, query, you know, whether it's time for an increase in real property taxes, that would be very hard on people. They won't like that at all. <clears throat> and of course, you have that inevitable, uh, inexorable cost of rail. Uh, and I wonder what your thought is on fiscal policy in order to have the city, you know, uh, strong enough to pay its bills and hold on to its people and continue its initiatives. Well, look, let's be candid with each other. There's going to be less money. 
Okay, there was a budget put forth that Caldwell didn't even sign that we will inherit, I say we, um, going in in January to then begin to work with, okay, halfway through a fiscal year. I think probably before we could even blink an eye, we'll be looking at, you know, what we're gonna do in the next year, but the first task at hand will be that budget and where we are, which, what's the reality. So um, I've been very clear, especially in the context of paying for the rail, the completion of the rail that would not raise property taxes you just made a very good point about the timing of that you know now i've heard every argument there was well the property taxes are really not all that high per se but the multiplier effect against the highest prices for homes and condos in the country is another thing but this is a very expensive place to live if you will so i think the first order of business is going to be you know on fiscal accountability is to really take a deep dive and ask the question why which is what we've always done in every turnaround on every dollar spent, what we can do without, where there's waste and whatever else we can possibly do. Um, and it's gonna to have to come in the context of the fact that you're absolutely right. It's not just in the short term for the remainder of 2020 or 21, it would be the beginning of 21, but it's, it's gonna be multiple years before we even get back uh, any kind of reasonable amount of money in GET and TAT. It's just, it's just the numbers are not gonna be there. I've yeah. seen the projections. It'll be a great challenge, but uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, there's a there's a big place for a businessman who has been through issues about raising money, spending money. Let me tell you what this is about, Jay, that nobody talks about. This is about leadership and making tough decisions. Nobody yet to date has even asked me a question about leadership. What does that mean? What does that look like? You know, it's all about this ethereal thing or this thing or whatever. I'm not suggesting you're not doing that this morning. No, no, no. But what about this leadership? Has a lot to, this has a lot to do with the personal help me, help me out on this, Rick. What about leadership? Yeah, well, thank you, KJ. I mean, look, I mean, it starts first and foremost that I've noticed in running for politics is, um, you know, or, or running for an office that I listen carefully. And I'm not saying this to denigrate my competitors, but it's pretty much who they are. It's about them. And it's a lot of I, 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 and I, I understand that. Anything I've ever been involved with, and uh, from a leadership standpoint, is understanding I don't get the job done by myself. And it's about being able to surround yourself and build a good team been pretty good in the people picking business. I think there's some extraordinary people in Hawaii, I know there are, who would want to come under these circumstances and fight for the future of the city, young and older. Plus, I think there's some pretty good people that are already working there. I don't want to say everybody's got to go. You know, some of that comes from the personal dynamics. I'll, I'll tell you from a coaching standpoint, okay, a great story I love, all right? Just let me digress for one second. I haven't done this with anybody, but I'm going to tell you. Okay, so... Don Shula, who recently passed away at the age of 90, goes in the Hall of Fame, NFL Football Hall of Fame in Canton. And he asked Bump Phillips, Wade Phillips' his father, great football coach, Hall of Famer himself, to introduce him. And I'm not going to do it in the Texas draw anymore that I would try to tell you a story in Pigeon with this Boston accent. But he said about Shula, the best thing I've ever heard about coaching. He simply said the thing about Don was he could take his and his team and come and beat Yorn. And then you could turn around, take you on, take your team and beat his. Okay? <laughs> I've always loved that. You know, that's what coaching and leadership is about, knowing what you do, the kind of decision making that goes on, how you facilitate that, how you flatten the organization, how you empower people, how you process things. You know, there's a lot to that. And I bring a lot of years of experience yeah. in doing that. And that's yeah. really understanding and surrounding yourself with the smartest thinkers, smartest doers, and more importantly, People will embrace the spirit of accountability because that's what people are going to be looking for as we look to turn the direction of our city around under really tough circumstances. That's okay. Well, here, here, let's, we only have a minute left. I'm going to ask you my last. Oh, question. I thought this was. They told me this was a two-hour interview. Well, I think we put a lot into it. Maybe two hours <laughs> worth. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jay. Really? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of people running, people who have been around for a while, people who have a certain amount of name recognition in political circles, one way or the other, may I say. Oh. <laughs> and, um, you know, here you are in a field of, I don't know what it is, a lot of people. Um, why should we vote for you, Rick Blangiarni? Well, I'm doing this um, out of love of place for all the right reasons. I bring a background of, I've been the guy my whole, whole career, Jay, that was hired to replace the person they fired and then fix it. And that, that's been, and, and I've had a lot of success. I've had success here in Hawaii. I love this place. Hawaii has given me much in return. It's loved me back in a way, you know, I could never imagine. This is where my life's work has been, my family, my kids were born here. Um, I feel blessed each and every day I'm here. 
So I want to go at this job with all the experience I have, understanding of what it takes from the standpoint of the leadership dynamic. I am not building, I have made it really clear, I'm not a politician, I'm not building a, I'm not building a political career. My decision making will not be compromised in that way. So I, I'm here to do the right thing, to serve. I'll just leave you with one, one little anecdote. Years ago, uh, I'm a big believer in servant leadership, but when you say the term servant leadership, a lot of people get lost in that. This is about working in service of others, which is why we even picked our campaign thing. It wasn't a political thing to say it's about you. I've always put others first, starting with my family and my stakeholders and employees. But years ago, I was reading an article, uh, uh, an excerpt that play about servant leadership, and it was written by George Bernard Shaw, the great Irish playwright in 1903. It was an excerpt from a play, a play called Man and Superman. And in that, in that paragraph, he talks about the harder I work, the more I live, the more I love. And then he says, very simply, because I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. I find myself now in this moment in time facing the biggest leadership challenge. It won't be that for anybody. The biggest leadership challenge of a lifetime. And I want to go at it with everything I have because I love this place. I owe it to this place. And that's why you should vote for me. All right. Rick Blangiardi, a confluence of events, a confluence of leadership. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us here on Think Tank. Jay, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Aloha. Aloha.